Good evening, church. Good evening. So glad to have you joining us in the house tonight or online. We're just thankful that you chose to be here. And we know God has great things in store. Amen. Have you been hearing about not just going what's going on in Asbury College? Have you been hearing about all the other places where revival is breaking forth? And, you know, I think it's an awesome thing to think about that, you know, if it can happen there, it can happen at another campus, and it can happen at another campus, and then it can also happen in God's house. And I, I heard a, a pastor commenting the other day um, talking about, you know, people have gotten to the point in churches where worship in, has been cut and cut and cut to about 15 minutes and then cut this and cut that and people are hungry for God to move and the worship opens up the door for God to do supernatural things amen so what are they doing they're going places and doing things getting away from that because they're going to the to the chapel at the school and they have freedom to worship and look what God does so aren't you glad tonight that he can break through what men have put in place so to say, and meet people where they are. Amen. And so I'm thankful tonight that we get the freedom here to worship the Lord and not be stifled and not be put, um, put it to the side. And if God decides to do it one way, we're going to go with him. Amen. And um, I can tell you one thing that it's not about a program, but it's about him moving in our lives. And he wants to speak to us. He wants to move in our, on our behalf. And we just have to be ready, receptive, and just welcome. You know, it's something you go into a, into somewhere that you just feel welcome. You want to go back. The same principle applies to the Holy Spirit where he feels welcome. He's going to come and come and come and come. So it's us that has the problem where we want to say, okay, Holy Spirit, go sit in your corner now. We're done. <laughs> yeah, don't do anything weird. But are, are we receptive tonight and say, Holy Spirit, come and move in us? I think we are. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you tonight. Thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity to just, to just move and speak to us in a real and mighty way tonight. And, Lord, we just open our hearts to hear and receive from you. Lord, it's not what we desire tonight necessarily, but we want to do what you want us to do. And so, God, we're going to worship you tonight in spirit and in truth. And, God, the word is going to come forth, and our faith is going to be strengthened. Our faith is going to grow. And, God, our lives are going to be transformed to become more like Jesus because we take this time tonight to just move and work with you, not against you, Holy Spirit, but work with you and what you want to accomplish. So God, we just come with surrender. God, just remove anything out of our lives that would be a hindrance from you speaking and having your way in us. Lord, we just come with surrendered hearts saying, do it again, Lord. Do it and move in our midst again tonight, Father. We bless you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. Seen and honor, glory and power, be to the ancient of day. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of day. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne in worship. You be. Exalted, O God, and your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. Blessing and honor, glory and power be to the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Away, 
our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Then what could stand
Give him another hand. He's worthy this evening, isn't he? Praise God. Glory to God. How great is our God. Praise God. Thank you, worship team. And why don't you welcome one another as you're seated tonight. Thank you, Jesus. How great is our God. Nobody like the Lord, is there? Glory to God. Praise God. Good to see you tonight. Good to have you in the house of the Lord. And uh, so grateful to be here. Anybody else? Yeah, and welcome back. You made it back pretty quick, didn't you? Look at that. Yeah, there you go. Well, praise the Lord. Well, welcome back. Amen. So glad to see you. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. And it's good to have Philip in a Wednesday night service. I tell you, aren't it good to see Philip back there? Yeah. One of our former students, and God really has his hand on Philip's life. And. This Philip too, but that Philip too back there. See, Philip here, up here, he's sitting here smiling. See, Hallelujah! <laughs> oh Jesus, what a wonderful day to serve the Lord. Amen. Praise God. I hear everybody talking about revival, and I was telling Mary before the service, we've got a few families that are coming new now to our services, and some of our uh, new people coming in brought other people with them this past Sunday. Did you notice that? Yes. And I uh, had a powerful day Sunday morning. And uh, and uh, one of our families came in a little late. I think I was just already up preaching or getting ready to get up and preach. So we got back in the back in the cafeteria and he said, 
he said to me, one of the young men said to me, have you heard about the revival in Asbury? I said, yeah, I just got through talking about it in the service in there. And then this ought to be encouraging to you as a church. And it really encouraged me. And uh, then he said, has anybody told anybody about the revival that's happening right here in this church? Praise the Lord. Wasn't that encouraging to hear? God's, how many of you know God's moving at first assembly? Amen. And so I thought I'd pass that on. It really encouraged me to hear that. And, uh, oh, Jesus. Amen, God. They, they are happening. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. God is doing something. I want to. I want to be right in the middle of it. Anybody else right in the middle of? And uh, I think it. Uh, how many of you know we're not dead here at First Assembly? See, and so what we're needing is some renewal and refreshing. And you have to revive something that's dead. And I'm glad we're not dead. Amen. But we're in a play and we're in a time of renewal. I really believe that today. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The Lord doing great things. Praise God. Well, I'm glad you made it, Bill. Praise the Lord. He made it. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Why don't you just lift your hands again and thank God for who he is, for what he's doing. Praise the Lord. Just worship him for a few seconds here. Glory to God. You know, someplace you don't have the freedom to do that. God, we give you glory. We magnify your name. We thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you that you always have us on your mind. Lord Jesus, we thank you that the best is ahead in every life that will allow you to move. And God, I thank you for moving in such a way way that people are drawn to you through us, through your people, God. Oh, we rejoice tonight because of the spirit of the Lord that's in the house and in us. We give you glory today. Great is our Lord. Great is our Lord. Praise the name of Jesus today. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Does anybody realize the freedom we do have here? Raise your hand if you really realize the freedom we have here. See? And I say that simply to say thank you, Jesus, that we have that. Amen? Amen? That we have that. We don't want to lose this freedom. Amen? Amen. Don't want to lose this freedom. Oh, Jesus. Next Wednesday, I'll be having, finally having the surgery on my right shoulder. Postponed it a while back, but March the 1st, I'll be having surgery. So I've already asked Brother Davis to speak next Wednesday. And uh, he was glad to do so. And I was so sick last Wednesday, I called him at 4.30. I tell you, he did good, didn't he, to come in to get called at 4.30. Uh, but, but so be, I just want to let you know that ahead of time, that I'll be having surgery and he'll be filling in. Also, Jeanette Rayner came home from the hospital today, went in on Saturday. And so if some of you can remember to call her or stop by, I believe it'd be a real encouragement to her. She was in intensive care and they, they put a pacemaker in but uh, thank God she's home and doing well. So I want to give you that report for her. Thank you, Lord. I'm so glad God's not finished with me. This coming, this coming July, uh, my wife and I will be in full-time ministry for 46 years. Been pastoring for, for 46 years. And I'm so grateful that God's not finished with me yet. How many of you glad he's not finished with you yet either? Amen. I'm so grateful that at my age, I'm still here and able to minister to you and be used of God. And he's so faithful. And I didn't say that because I'm old. I'm saying that because I'm getting older. Okay. Praise the Lord. But I'm excited about whatever is next in my life. Are you? How many of you excited about what's next in your life? Anybody here excited about what's next in this church, in this community, and in this world? Yes. There's so many people from our own church and others that come in to visit that they feel like our church is, uh, is, is on the verge of just exploding. And, and I really believe that too. God is doing some awesome things. 
Tonight, I was going to teach some of this last week, and then I've been praying and seeking the Lord and have added, added a little bit to it. It's called The Next Step in the Right Direction. And about 10 years or so ago, I preached a message along these same lines. The next step in the right direction. Elijah was one of the prominent prophets of God in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, does anybody, anybody here excited about the victories that's already happening? Amen. Three people. Let's say it together and get them, the rest of them excited. Ready? Let's go back. Can't skip it tonight. If I'm out one Sunday, you, you raise your hand, you holler, say, wait a minute. <laughs> All right, let's do it. A year of victories in 2023. God is changing me. With God's help, I am adding to my faith. As I trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit guides me. Jesus and others are my priority. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Romans 8, 37. For every child of God defeats this evil world and we achieve the victory through our faith. 1 John 5, 4. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so... Praise God, victories in 2023 and they're continuing to happen. The next step in the right direction. Elijah was one of the prominent prophets of God in the Old Testament. But before we go to 1 Kings 19, I'll tell you a little bit about what was happening just before. Uh, before chapter 19, uh, Elijah had, had faced 450 prophets of Baal. He'd faced 400 prophets of the groves, all of them, all of them together. And Baal was a false, a false man-made God that wasn't real. He had no life and he had no power. I'm glad he's not my God, anybody else. And all alone, except for his God, all alone, Elijah said, let's find out who the one real God is. The God who sends fire from heaven, he's the one we will serve. We will serve. Baal's prophets build an altar. They place the sacrifice upon it and nothing happened. They cried, they screamed, they yelled, they jumped, they danced, they rolled. Scripture says they even started cutting themselves, hoping by cutting their se- themselves that it would get the attention of their God. But nothing ever happened. That's 850 prophets of Baal and of, of the groves. Finally, Elijah built an altar to the Lord. Your altar should always be to him. It's more about him in your life than it is about you. Amen. Than it is about me. He built an altar to the Lord. He put the bull sacrifice on it. And he drenched the sacrifice in the altar with water three times. Elijah prayed and God sent fire. You remember the story? God sent fire and consumed the sacrifice. He consumed the altar, burned up the altar, burned up the, uh, the sacrifice, licked up the water in the trench around the sacrifice and around the altar. All 800, and, and isn't that like our God? He can do something, anything that nobody else can do. And so uh, all 850 false prophets were put to death. See, our God, the God we serve, is the God that sent the fire. He sent the fire and, and the, to uh, consume the, the altar and the sacrifice. And on Acts chapter 2, he sent the fire of the Holy Ghost. And I just want to know tonight, is there anybody here that has any fire in your life at all? Amen, through the help of the Holy Ghost today. Dear oh Lord, a bunch of hands went up. So I'm expecting amens and shouts all the way through tonight, all right? Praise the Lord. He's still the God of fire, isn't he? When God got, uh, and then word got out, to Jezebel. Anybody ever heard of Jezebel? And uh, Queen Jezebel, what had happened? All of her prophets were killed. Of course, she'd been killing the prophets of God. But when she heard all those prophets uh, were killed, what Elijah had done or his God had done, then she sought Elijah to kill him, to take his life. And uh, and that's a whole other story and a whole other message tonight. After all the miracles God performed at Elijah's word, Elijah sat down and said, enough. He told God, he said, I've had enough. I'm done. Isn't it something to be so mildly used of God and a woman caused Elijah to run and it was after he ran for his life and, and God still used him after that for a little, just a short while. And then he says, God, I'm done. 
Sometimes you need to run from a woman, amen? But, okay. But he said, God, I'm done. He said, God, I've had enough. Just let me die. Wow. <laughs> Be careful what you pray for and what you ask God for because you just might get it. He said, God, let me die. I've had enough. I'm done. And so God began to put things in work. See, there's nowhere in Scripture that it says that God was finished with Elijah. Nowhere. Elijah decided he'd had enough. So in 1 Kings 19, verse 16, God said to Elijah, two more things I want you to do. Number one, anoint Jehu to be king over Israel. And then he said to Elijah, now go anoint Elisha to be the prophet in your place. And this is where our scripture is going to pick up tonight. So as you stand in honor of the word of God and 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 19. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So Elijah went and found Elisha son of Shaphath, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak or his coat across his shoulders and then walked away. Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah and said to him, first let me go and kiss my, my father and my mother goodbye, and then, I'll go, then I will go with you. Elijah replied, go on back, go on back, but think about what I have done to you. So Elisha returned to his auction, oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople and they all ate. Then he went with Elisha, or Elijah, as his assistant. Hallelujah. Father, we want to thank you today for your wonderful word. We want to thank you for the privilege we've had already to worship, to clap our hands, to sing, to shout, to cry, to testify. God, we thank you for freedom to worship right now at First Assembly of God. Lord, we don't take lightly this great privilege. And Lord, we don't take lightly the privilege of preaching the word and somebody being allowed to say, Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that our hands are not tied and neither are our lips closed when it comes to praising the Lord. God, thank you for what you're going to do throughout this time together. And thank you for your word that's continuing to change us to become like you. We give you glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Praise God. When Elijah, Complete Biblical Library says, when Elijah threw his shaggy, worn garment of skin, animal skin onto Elisha's shoulders, it had a twofold uh, symbolism. So when he threw it on his shoulder, two symbolism. Number one is this. It meant the adoption of Elisha by Elijah to be his spiritual son. So when he threw that coat on, he's saying, this is my son in the spirit. This is my son in God. Second symbolism that came with that was it meant a distinct call to the prophetic office. A distinct call to the prophetic office. So you, you might be wondering why in the world somebody would, would, uh, would do something like that. But Elijah or Elisha knew. Hallelujah. Unbelievable, unpredictable miracles were performed through Elijah's obedience to God. How many of you know God wants to use you just as much as he wants to use me? How many of you know you can pray this for the sick just as well as I can pray for the sick and see them healed and see God work in their lives? So obedience. He performed miracles through obedience to God. And then as, as with Elisha, there are some sitting here tonight and maybe watching online as well who know, who know without a doubt that God has a plan for your life or for you in ministry. Did anybody hear that? 
that God has a plan in your life for ministry. Now, all believers are called to be ministers. Maybe not to be a pastor. Maybe not to travel to a foreign mission field. Maybe to not be apostle or prophet. But every believer that receives Christ is called to be a minister as far as telling other people about Jesus. Every one of us are to be a witness and tell to share Jesus. The gospel story is in our heart and in our hands to give away. What God's done for you and what he's done for me, what he's doing for us, he's doing that because he loves us, but he's doing that soon, so we will give away what he's given to us. And the good thing about it, when we give it away, we don't lose anything. We just keep gaining, don't we? Hallelujah. This gospel story. What God has done in our lives and your life needs to be shared with others. So we need to be telling his story and we need to be telling our story. Our neighbors, our family, our friends, people, you're going to run into people who need to hear what God's done in your life because some of them are stuck in life where you used to be. And because you tell your story and tell what God's done for you, it may help them get unstuck or have the faith to believe God for them. <laughs> for them. And there are those who, with a specific callings to the ministry. So I want to say to you tonight, whether you're called to specific ministry or whether you're, you're uh, along with all the rest of us, we know what we're called to do to share Jesus. There's two verses I want to read as we get into this. Not one of them is in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10. Chapter 9 and 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whether thou goest. In other words, if you're going to do anything for Jesus, if you're going to serve him, serve him with your whole heart and do it today because you're not going to be able to do it after you die. And sometimes we think we've got all this time and we'll just wait and we find ourselves old and never fulfilling what God has called us to do. Colossians 3.23 says this, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. The best employers on the job ought to be Christians. Amen? Best employers should be, should be Christians. See, whatever you do, do it heartily. So if we look at everything we do, you know, God, is for you. Even what we do around our own home ought to be our best. Not just because we want people to look and say, boy, how nice it is. We do want that, don't we? but because it glorifies him. So everything we do in private and, and work and in ministry, wherever it's at, needs to be done for him and for his glory. So number one, as we begin tonight, is this. Elisha learned to serve before he could lead. If a person's not willing to serve, they don't ever need to lead. Jesus set the example of servant leadership. If anybody had the right for, other, for others to be washing his feet, it was Jesus. If people should have been serving anybody, they should have been serving him, you know, to drink, to food or whatever in any way that they could. But Jesus is the greatest example of servant leadership. And even in the Old Testament, Elisha had to serve before he could lead. And so if you feel like God's calling you to lead, listen, if you're not willing to serve, you might as well forget it. Because if you get into leadership and not willing to serve, you'll be arrogant. You'll want all the credit. You'll find your heart filled with pride. Amen? And people will look at you and not look at him. And he's never called us to do such a way that they look at us instead of him. They need to recognize the Jesus in us, right? But look at him. Look at him. So I say it a third time. Elisha learned to serve before he could lead. Elisha was persistent in his following of Elijah. You'll see in a few moments. He listened as Elijah spoke. He, he watched as he prayed and he saw the things Elijah spoke come to pass. Wow, think about that. He took everything in that he could. 
We need to take everything that we, in can, we can when we read the Word. We need to take everything we in that we can when we hear preaching and teaching. We need to take everything in that we can when we got our hands lifted and when the worship team's going on. It's not just a show. Listen, we're here to meet with God and we're here to be changed by His power and His presence and His Word. Amen. We're not here for any other purpose but to glorify and to magnify Him. He took everything in. We need to take everything in. He heard Elijah prophesy after Jezebel sought him to kill him. He prophesied about Ahab and Jezebel's death. Anybody remember how Jezebel died? Fell out, fell out of the window and what happened to her? And the dog laid her up. I mean, like that kind of death. But he prophesied that. And see, Elisha lived to see that prophecy come to pass. We don't know exactly how long Elisha had to wait before he became the prophet who took Elijah's place. But we do know that he stuck with Elijah, following him around like a dog following his master. (laughs) I mean, he followed him around, serving him, obeying him until it was his time to lead. You heard me uh, before I ever went to Southeastern University in Florida before I ever went there I was already involved in ministry doing different things in the church started preaching about age 15 didn't preach a lot but I started preaching about then and then I got into Bible college and uh, you've heard me say this before I really felt like the Lord was going to come before I got out I was looking for Jesus to come and, and Lord I, I want to get out and preach some and, before you come and, well That's been a long time ago. He hasn't come yet, and I've been pastoring a long time. And uh, he is still coming, though. Amen. He is still. Not too long before Elisha received his double portion anointing that he asked for, he walked with Elijah through an experience that could have easily changed his mind. So let's go to 2 Kings chapter 1. 2 Kings 1 uh, and verse 1. Says and King Ahab's de- after King Ahab's death, the the land of Moab rebelled against Israel. One day, Israel's new king Ahaziah fell through the lattice of an upper room at his palace in Samaria and was seriously injured. So he sent messengers to the temple, to the temple of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, to ask whether he would recover. But the angel of the Lord told Elijah, who was from Tishba. Go and confront the messengers of the king of Samaria and ask them, is there no God in Israel? Why are you going to Beelzebub, to the God of Ekron, to ask whether the king will recover? Now, therefore, this is what the Lord says. You will never leave the bed you're lying on. You will surely die. So Elijah went to deliver the message. When the messengers returned to the king, he asked them, why have you returned so soon? They replied, a man came up to us and told us to go back to the king and give him this message. This is what the Lord says. Is there no God in Israel? Why are you sending men to Beelzebub, the God of Ekron, to ask whether you will recover? Therefore, because you have done this, you will never leave the bed you're living, lying on and you will surely die. What sort of man was he, the king demanded. What did he look like? I can almost see him right now, panicking. They replied, he was a hairy man. He wore a leather belt around his waist. Elijah from Tishba, the king, Elijah from Tishba, the king exclaimed. Then he sent an army captain of 50 soldiers to arrest him. They found him sitting on top of a hill. The captain said to him, man of God, the king has commanded you to come down with us. But Elijah replied to the captain, If I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and destroy you and your 50 men. Then fire fell from heaven and killed them all. I may be glad. I'd I'd, I'd want to be with Elijah. So the king sent another captain of 50 men. The captain said to him, Man of God, the king demands that you come down at once. Elijah replied, If I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and destroy you and your 50 men. And again, the fire of God fell from heaven and killed all of them. Dear Lord, once more the king sent a third captain with 50 men. I'd be afraid to go the third time, wouldn't you? Yeah, just send one. Don't kill them all. 
But this time the captain went up the hill and he fell to his knees before Elijah. I'd be falling too. He replied, he pleaded with him, oh man of God, please spare my life and the lives of these, your 50 servants. Wow, can you imagine that? 15. Okay, it's supposed to go through 18. Oh, I haven't yet? All right, sorry about that. See how the fire came down from, from heaven, came down and destroyed the, the first two groups. But now, please, please spare my life. Then the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him and don't be afraid of him. So Elijah got up and went with him to the king. And Elijah said to the king, this is what the Lord says. Why did you send messengers to Beelzebub, Beelzebub, the God of Ekron, to ask whether you will recover? Is there no God in Israel to answer your questions? Therefore, because you've done this, you will never leave the bed you're lying on. Three times he's been told that. You will surely die. So so Ahaziah died just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Since Ahaziah did not have a son to succeed him, his brother Joram became the next king. This took place in the second year of the reign of Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. The rest of the events in Ahaziah's reign are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. Now here's Elisha. He's just had a mantle or a cloak or a coat thrown on his shoulders. He knows what that means. He knows he's called to be a prophet. Can you imagine Elisha watching Elijah each time those men came? They came to take him away, and all these men got killed. At least he was on the right side. Don't you know he's beginning to want, if it were you, wouldn't you say, Lord, you sure you've called me to this? So right away, so he began to see things that could, could make him question his calling. Don't you know that's how Satan works? If God's got his hand on your life and for some specific purpose, and if you know Jesus anyhow and begin to serve him like you should, don't you know that the enemy is going to do what he can to discourage you from following through? from walking with God. Some of us, he's held back from stepping into what God's called us to do because we've not been brave enough or bold enough to step out and begin. Am I telling you the truth tonight? Amen. Amen. Now, Elijah threatened 50 soldiers sent to rest. Telling the truth is not always popular. I've had people come up after a service and say, uh, Pastor Bracken, you're preaching. Uh, I just lost it. Yeah, but uh, he said, you're preaching blasphemy. I thought I'd heard from God. Preach the word. You're preaching blasphemy. But I knew it wasn't. You're going to serve the Lord? You're going to fulfill your call? You're going to be where he wants you to be. You're going to be accused. Satan's going to accuse you. Not everybody's going to like you. And not everybody's going to love you. But there's one who will love you, lead you, guide you, empower you, strengthen you, walk with you so you'll never be alone, so you can do what he's called you to do. Hallelujah. Aren't you grateful for that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Telling the truth is not always popular. Obeying God is not always popular. And people say, we have, you know, we, we, we've not done it this way before. Did you know there's some churches, if you, this is the truth, there's some churches that if you try to move the furniture on the platform, you almost have a church split. Seriously. I heard of one church where they moved the piano from one side to the other one inch at a time. Till they finally got it to the other side. Aren't you glad it doesn't matter what side the piano is on? How many of you don't matter what side the piano is on? How many of you just glad we have people to play it and lead us in worship and have God move in this house? Hallelujah. Twice 50 men sent. Twice fire came down and killed 50. Why? Both times Elijah said, I'm a man of God. If I'm a man of God, then cause fire to fire will fall and destroy you. If I'm a man of God. 
See, Elijah knew he was a man of God. He knew he was a prophet. Any man here know that you're a man of God? You might not be a pastor. Or Come on, how many of you know you're a man of God? Maybe you're not a pastor or a prophet, but you know he's in your heart. And you know, how many of you women know you're a woman of God? Glory to God. Nobody has to tell you. You have to know that you're a man or a woman of God. When you know that, God will work for you. If you're not sure, you need to make sure. Some people think they're saved, hope they're ready for heaven. Listen, you're not going to think your way in. You're going to have to know you're going to get in. Amen? Hallelujah. I'm not saying you have to be a prophet, but you do have to be real. We all have to be real. The third time Elijah went to them, went with them to see the king. It's one thing to prophesy. Let me say this too. It's one thing to prophesy in church. It's one thing to prophesy or speak into a person's life. It's another thing to prophesy and tell the king or the president that he's going to die. You'd have to know it's God to tell President Biden today you're going to die. Amen? Or to tell Trump when he was in there you're going to die. (laughs) Wow. Elisha was there. He saw it all. He heard it all. At times, I'm sure, fear did get a hold of him. Is there anybody here after you got saved, even if you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, that has ever battled fear even since you were filled with the Spirit or since you see? Because see, fear is real. He'll use your past to bring up to try to make you think you're not right, make you fear that you're not saved. Or he'll bring fear from nowhere to try to discourage you and defeat you and keep you from stepping out. So sometimes, I believe at times, fear probably gripped Elisha. At other times, I'm sure faith filled his heart. You know, you see God moving or he's working your heart in a way that, God, you're just so filled with faith. He saw God stand up, stand up for Elijah. Didn't God stand up for Elijah more than once? How many of you believe God will stand up for you? See, I know he stood up for me. He's going to do it again. He's going to do it again for you if you walk with the Lord. He saw God fulfill his word in Elijah's life. Number two is this. Elijah, Elisha was being prepared to be God's man for the next season. For some of us, the next season is now. Say it again. For some of us, the next season is now. And God is saying, get up, it's time. For some of us, God is still working on working on us, trying to get us to the place we will say yes. The steps we take each day are steps that lead us into our tomorrow, to what God has for us. I'm glad I don't know everything about tomorrow. If you and I knew some of the things we'd face, we'd stay right where we are. We wouldn't grow old, would we? We'd sit here and rot and die. See? (laughs) Oh, Jesus. See, everyday events can prepare us to be better used of God. Each day is different. None of the days are the same. Some days are difficult and some are pretty good. Full of joy and peace. I like that song, This is the Day. This is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice. And that should be every day. You can find something in every day to rejoice in the Lord about, no matter what situation you're in. See? The Bible also says the steps of a righteous man. We'll put a put woman in there too. Righteous man are ordered of the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Romans 8, 28, many of us know by heart. What? What is it? Anybody know? We know, we know what? 
that all things work together for good to them who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. I love that verse, don't you? All things in each day work together for, for our good. If we love him and are following, it's for our good. But there's a couple of verses before this that kind of preface this verse. And, and let's just go there. I, I don't know if he has it there or not, but I have it here, Romans 8, 20. You got it, don't you? Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So Now why did I want to read that and connect it with Romans 8, 28? Because you see, the Holy Spirit must be active in us for Romans 8, 28 to work. You can't just be a church goer. The Holy Spirit has to be active in your life and mine for Romans 8, 28 to be applied to my life. If God's not working in your life and mine through the help of the Holy Spirit, then we're not going to be able to experience Romans 8, 28 for all things to work together for our good. The Holy Spirit has to be active in our lives for that word. I love that verse, but listen, if I'm not letting God work in my life, it's just another few words on a piece of paper. It's life to those who know him and believe it and get hold of it. It's life. <laughs> when we see good or bad, see, and or what we're going through, that when we go through good and bad. God uses the good and bad to and, and reshapes and, and molds those things somehow to fit into our lives to bring us to, to the place God wants us to be in his plan. I don't know if I could say all that again, but how many of you understood what I said? Okay. I don't understand that, but he does. The bad and the good. He puts his hand in the middle of that and he works and he shapes and he molds because he doesn't just want you to know him. He wants you to be where he wants you to be, doing what he wants you to do. And if you and I know we're in the place at this moment, this time in our life where we should be, there is no better place to be. He puts his hand on that thing, those things, and works them until he is lifted up and we become stronger. Because all through the process as he shapes us and molds and he works in the good and the bad circumstances, see, the end result, and hopefully through the process, he's receiving the glory. And you and I are getting out of the circumstances, the trials, the things, and even the good things, the things that we need to shape us to become like him and to be stronger. And if there's anything I want to do, it's be stronger. Hallelujah. Even the worst things we go through, God uses to prepare us to be our best. Amen. The third thing is, Elisha was determined to be at the right place at the right time. And God's timing is everything. It's everything. It's everything. Number four, Elisha kept his eyes on, on his master because he knew the anointing was going to come. This past Sunday morning, of course, for, had the virus, stomach virus. And uh, I, I do have some issues at time, have been having Issues where I just walk, lose my balance walking. Some of you have seen me. Some of you reached out to grab me and keep me from falling. Doctors have tried to figure out what they, what's causing it and uh, don't know. I've been praying over myself for God to heal me. And I've had, last week I had a lot of that. Had some Sunday morning. And so here I am supposed to preach Sunday morning. And I was battling some with that. But when I stepped on the platform. 
and opened up the book, the anointing came. Could anybody tell Sunday morning I was having trouble? See, the anointing came. There's nothing like having the anointing of the Lord on your life, and not just for preaching. You better have it if you're going to preach, Amen. teach, but on our daily lives. Don't we need that? Elijah kept his eyes on the master because he knew the anointing was come. Second Kings 2 and 1. Second Kings 2 and 1. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal. And Elisha said to Elijah, or Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. But Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives... And as yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went down together to Bethel. The group of prophets from Bethel came to Elisha and asked him, Did you know the Lord's going to take your master away from you today? Of course I know, Elisha said. Elisha answered, But be quiet about it. I don't want to hear it. Then Elijah told Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Jericho. But Elisha replied again, As surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went on together to Jericho. Then the group of prophets from Jericho came to Elisha and asked him, Did you know the Lord's going to take your master away from you today? Of course I know. I can almost see him getting irritated, can't you? Elisha answered, Be quiet about it. I don't want to hear it. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord told me to go to the Jordan River. But again, Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives and yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went on together. Wow. Went on together. <laughs> Elisha knew God's call meant that he would have to, Elijah knew that God's call meant he would have to take Elisha's place, Elijah's place as a prophet. Elisha knew that. Yet he did not want to lose Elijah as his mentor. I've had some great mentors in my life. Daryl Russian in Cayville, Florida. I saw him lay on the pews at, on, at night and pray and pray and cry until he'd fall asleep and half the night there praying. Daryl Rushing. Fred Sorrells. Called him Mr. Pentecost in the mountains. Helped build a bunch of churches. Had a real deep voice, but a mighty man of God. Steve Powers, though younger than me, was a good mentor for just a little while. Brother Hogan in Newburn for a while was my mentor. Charles Kelly, our former district superintendent, he's really been my mentor over the years. So I look back and God's put people over me in my life. <laughs> to help me grow, Charles Cookman. I didn't think the district could survive without Charles Cookman. How many of you remember Brother Cookman? And he was a great mentor in my life. So I look back at all the different ones that have been my mentor. You, know, you remember Brother Russian too at Kville and so many. See, he didn't want to lose his mentor. He kept telling others, be quiet. He didn't want to hear that Elijah was going to be taken. When someone has affected your life or impacted your life as, as, as a mighty man or woman of God, you don't want to lose them. You don't want them to die. You don't want them to retire. You don't want them to leave. You want to keep them in your life. Even though Elisha knew he was going to be the next prophet in Elijah's stead, he still wanted to hold on to him. Now let's go to 2 King, chapter 2, verse 9. When they came to another side, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I am taken away. Elisha replied, Please let me inherit a double share. King James says a double portion of the spirit, of your spirit, and become your successor. So now he's asking to become his successor, yet he already knows he's going to be. And he said to him, You've asked a difficult thing. Elijah replied, if you see me when I am taken from you, then you will get your request. And one of the reasons he said it was a difficult thing is because it wasn't Elijah's to give. It was God's to give. Don't try to give somebody something that only God can do. Don't tell somebody something you think if God's not in that what you say. 
Okay, you've asked a difficult thing, Elijah replied. If you see me when I'm taken from you, then you will get your request. But if not, then you won't. <laughs> wow. I've got a sheet here. Let me, get, let me find it here. On verse 10, 9 and 10. It says, Elijah then invited Elisha to ask what he wanted from him before he would be taken away. Elisha's request he requested the blessing of the firstborn, a double portion. But Elisha wanted spiritual rather than material blessings. He was not asking to be twice as popular as Elijah or to perform twice as many miracles. Elisha was asking to be the successor of Elijah and to be privileged to carry on the ministry, his ministry under God. However, this was not Elijah's to give. For that reason, it was a difficult thing. Elijah did not want, want it. Won't, did not know if God would grant Elijah, Elisha's request. So the, sign, the sign that he would grant it would be Elisha actually seeing Elijah being taken away from him. This was not a condition for Elijah, Elisha to receive the double portion, but the evidence that he would. The evidence. It seems like there's a scripture in the New Testament that talks about faith. Faith is the what? Substance of things seen and the evidence of things not seen. Amen. Hallelujah. You have to stick close to Jesus. You and I have to stay close to him. You've heard me say over the years more than once, you've got to stay in Jesus. Amen. Satan wants to get it, you out of him. You've got to stay in Jesus, and he has to stay in you. If you're going to walk with God, you're going to be anointed of the Holy Spirit and do what he wants you to do. You have to stick close to Jesus we can't afford to shift our focus somewhere else. We've got to work. We've got to provide. We've got all kinds of things we have to do. But Jesus Christ has to be right in the middle of all of that. Now, Second Kings chapter 2 and verse, what do I have there? Verse 11 through 15. As they were walking along and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared drawn by horses of fire. It drove between the two men, separating them, and Elijah was carried away in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, I see the chariots and the charioteers of Israel. And as they disappeared from sight, Elisha tore his clothes in distress. Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak which had fallen when he was taken up. Then Elisha returned to the bank of the Jordan River. He struck the water with Elijah's cloak, and he cried out, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Then the river divided, and Elisha went across. When, a, when the group of prophets from Jericho saw from a distance what happened, they exclaimed, Elijah's spirit rests upon Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed down to the ground before him. What a story. See, the next step matters. It's what you, do, you and I decide to do next, mat, what we, matters now. But none of us want to stay where we are. The next step in our walk with God matters. The next step in ministry matters. The next step in what God wants us to do matters. The next step in what he wants us to learn matters. The next step in holiness matters. The next step in serving matters. I don't want to misstep. Anybody else tonight? Jesus said, see, Jesus sends the anointing on those who continue. Anybody here decide to continue? Say, don't want to stop now. Casey, nothing to go back to, is there? I want to continue. I pray one scripture out of Hebrews, that chapter 13, daily and before every time I preach, says, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect or complete. And I always say, oh, God, make me perfect or complete in, in, in every good work to do your will. Work, and he says, working in you that which is well-pleasing to him. And I always say, work in me 
that which is well pleasing in your sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. I pray it every day. I pray it when I'm studying the word. I pray it before I get up to preach because I want God to work in me his will and his purpose. And this is really what Elijah, Elisha wanted. And I got a feeling with the nods and the amens and the hands going up that you that are here with me, that's what you want. Yeah. Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. The next step in the right direction is to keep your focus on Jesus. I pre preached about Peter some this past Sunday, remember, in our message. In Matthew 14, Jesus was walking on water. Peter spoke from the safety of the boat. And he said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come to you. And Jesus said, come. Peter stepped out in faith on Jesus' word. Come. He walked on water until he took his eyes off of Jesus, then he began to sink. A lot of people are not in church today because they've shifted their focus to their business, to their money, to recreation, to other things other than Jesus. I run into them and they say, I still love the Lord. They may love the Lord, but they don't love him to the degree they should. Because when we love him with our whole heart, like he says, where are we going to want to be? In his house. What are we going to be wanting to do? Serving him and pleasing him. Hallelujah. The next step in the right direction is yours and mine. We must keep Jesus at the center of our lives. He's got to remain the focus. I know we have to work. I know we have to. But we can do those things and still keep him right here. And it's when he's right here, when he's the center, then we can touch people for him. Amen. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Walk with him. The anointing will come. And he'll anoint you at the times that you need the anointing to speak, to witness, to serve, to do a ministry, whatever it is. I applaud people who are living out their calling. Everybody should be doing something. Amen? And everybody should be involved in their local church in some way. If not there yet, they need to grow and get there to where they can be involved. So there's a lot of things people can do even right after they come in. I like people with the right attitude and the right smile. They can stand at the door and say, hey, I'm glad, hey, I'm glad you came today. Amen. I applaud those who are living out their calling. And I've said this before too. I'm sure I appreciate people who say, I'll take that until you find somebody. I appreciate people who are willing to serve, though that's not where they are called to. Don't you? Steve and Laurie are, are over, have oversight of children and youth ministry. They've really been doing a great job having oversight in, in that ministry and being involved in both those ministries. But Steve knows that's not his main calling. But yet he's doing a great job. He shared with me what his main calling is. And one of these days, we're going to have a youth pastor children's pastor and he'll be able to step into more of what his real calling is. Next time you see Laurie and Steve just say thank you for serving and helping and leading. Others that are sitting here have served at different times and that's not what you really were called to do but you stepped in and you helped until things changed and somebody else stepped in. But all ministries function better when somebody's called to that. People don't need to be singing on the worship team if they just like to sing and that's all there is to it. They have to be called to it. And if they're not called to sing and minister, they don't need to be up there. Amen?
So I have a question for those who are holding back. Been waiting, hoping someday your day will come. <laughs> so here's the question. What's taking you so long? Might be somebody listening there, somebody here. What's taking you so long? When I went up for my ordination, I had my certified, then I had my license. I had to preach my minister's license after that. And I pastored for years before I ever went up and applied for ordination. Walked in Brother Cookman's office and we sat down and he said, Brother Leo, what took you so long? I got involved in doing, the, doing ministry and things and just didn't do it. But when I did, what took you so long? Never forget that. So I ask you, what's taking you so long? You see, Satan wants to rob, rob us of, of our potential until it's too late. Good, Satan is good at interrupting God's plan for our lives. Life can be so busy that we miss God's best. Have you ever looked back and said, I wish I had? And even when it comes to ministry sometimes, you know, I should have stepped back out then and I didn't. But God still used you and you're glad that he does. Life can be so busy we miss God's best. The next step in the right direction, keep your eyes on Jesus, not just me, but you, us. Oh, and by the way, you can't walk on water if you don't get out of the boat. They need to read the book, don't they, Jason? You can't walk on water to get out of the boat. So as I close, don't wait so long to get involved or and miss your best years of working of God working through you. Don't lose your best years. Don't miss the, your best years to do what God's called you. And I know there's a timing, and I know there's a place. But sometimes... We're not waiting on God. God's waiting on us. And some ministries suffer because people are called and never step up to fulfill their calling. So I want to encourage you today, if there's anybody here or that's, that, that's you, I don't want you to miss what God has for you. Listen, it don't take long to go from 26 to 72 blink of an eye I went white headed and don't know how or when just looked in the mirror and it's white one day you don't have to worry about that do you not to, are you taking it <laughs> oh Jesus have I made sense tonight just you know kind of preachy teachy you know just, just kind of share some things let's stand together thank you Lord thank you Lord Jesus Praise the Lord. I want to say thank you to the different ones that gave on Sunday back in the back in the gym toward Hoven Home. You heard about it, right? A lot of people gave. And I camp somebody came up with about a thousand dollars. I'm not mistaken. You ask Rosie when you get back. Isn't it wonderful that people give when they see the need? Aren't you glad he's got his hand on you? How many of you here have a reason to really praise God tonight? How many of you glad you're not where you used to be? Come on, just do it for a while. Just worship him for a while. Hallelujah. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Lord, you redeem me. Set me free from my sin. Made me a new person. You came to live within. Now I'm changed, Lord. I'm so glad I'm changed, Lord. You made me new. You made me new. I'm so grateful for your mercy. 
<laughs> for your kindness. You saw me before I ever saw you. You loved me before I ever loved you. I'm forgiven. <laughs> I'm forgiven. Now I'm walking, Lord, in newness of life. I have a future that I can live out for you. And I thank you, Lord. And I thank you, Lord. Give you glory, God. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm privileged, Lord. <laughs> I'm privileged, Lord. You are. I am blessed, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, my Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Adore you, Lord. Adore you, Lord. Thank you, God. Go ahead. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship His home. Oh, 
mention something to you, and if anybody needs prayer, I'll be glad to pray with you. Uh, this morning, of course, I think you all know that Kayla has been expecting, got married in Texas, and then expecting this morning, Laurie got the call, and I was in there when she got it. So I was with her when she got the first picture of her their new little grandson born today. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. So he's, I think his name, what did I tell you his name was? Uh, Arthur. Yeah, his name is Arthur. So when you see, say, how you doing, Grandma and Grandpa? And well, the next time you see them, and uh, we congratulate them, and Kayla's doing really well, and we just rejoice with them. Anybody need prayer tonight before we go? Thank you, Jesus. Hope you've been challenged, refreshed, encouraged, somehow ministered to tonight. No? Okay, Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your anointing. We thank you that you're right here with us. And Lord, you have, you've made this service great because of who you are. Now, God, walk with us, go with us, work through us for your glory in the wonderful name of Jesus. Help us be ready for the next step, whatever that is. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Fellowship. Amen. Praise God. Fellowship. Shake hands. Greet one another.